So in this video, we're looking at all the best bits of the Gen 3 or the Evo version of the 2.0-litre TDI engine. So typically, you'll find this in cars from around 2015 onwards. Depending on the region you're in, there may be some exceptions. They may have used up old parts on some of the older models, and other models within the Volkswagen Group range tend to use up the older engines before the newer ones come out. And a few may have got the newer engines a little bit earlier. So make sure you fully understand which engine you've got in your car and that it is the newer Gen 3 Evo version of the 2.0-litre TDI. So it would certainly have the EA288 badge on it somewhere. So the problems that are affected the older versions of this engine were problems with camshaft wear, cam follower wear, oil pump issues, timing problems and carbon buildup on the actual valves. We're going to look at the ways that the Volkswagen Group have engineered out these problems that just kept cropping up on so many of the older engines. So we're going to see how they address the problem of carbon buildup on the valves, the cracking of the cylinder heads, the timing tensioner issues that were notorious on some of the older engines and other issues that would crop up in the engine, primarily due to the heating cycle. So it's going to be interesting to see how they've addressed the heat issues within this new design of the 2.0-litre TDI engine. So it was around about 2012 that the Volkswagen Group set about a dramatic redesign of the 2.0-litre TDI engine. The previous EA189 had its fair share of issues and problems. They certainly had improved things from the EA188, but there was certainly a need to improve things further. So the EA288 diesel engine came out and we started to see it being fitted in cars and it was a dramatic reworking of this diesel power plant that they'd had for so long. And the question is, have they evolved the design on? Have they ironed out all of the problems previous versions have had through clever engineering and innovations that have been added to it? Around seven years after its initial launch, there was an Evo version of the EA288, which really did refine things even further. So in this video, we're just going to look at the dramatic improvements that happened in the EA288, including the Evo version, and just answer the question, have Volkswagen ironed out the problems and what have they done specifically to address or mitigate some of the issues of the earlier engines? So the question is, will these 2020 engines that we see in modern versions in the Volkswagen Group cars be more reliable and problem free than their predecessors. Well, at the moment, we're only about three years down the line, so it's probably too early to tell. But please let us know in the comments if you've got one of these Evo versions of the engine or you've got a 2020 onwards version and let us know what problems you have so we can see if there are any problems that are starting to develop or patterns that are starting to form. So our video on the two litre TDI has been quite popular. We've had lots of questions, lots of comments, lots of suggestions. We did promise initially that we would focus on the Gen 3 version of the 2.0-litre TDI. It wasn't something we could include in that original video just because so much has changed in the various generations. So the EGR has been completely revised. We'll talk about the different setups they've used on the EGR system in a bit. The DPF filters, the regeneration cycles have been changed. It's been recited. It's much more efficient. So you're less likely to have the problems of your DPF filter clogging up like you had on the early versions of this engine. So the technology that's been used, the direct injection, the DPFs, the EGRs, Volkswagen have really looked at all the inherent problems that people have had over the years and ironed these out. They've looked to design these issues and problems out with the Gen 3 engines. So power versions traditionally used to be below 150 horsepower, 150 horsepower and 170 horsepower. So the Volkswagen Group have been able to bump that up now with the Gen 3 version of the 2.0-litre TDI. So we've got 190 horsepower version at the top end, which contains quite a number of refinements and revisions over the lower capacity engine. Engines. You've got a 150, a 110 and a 105 horsepower version. Some of these are going to vary depending on the region you live in and what is available. The cars are specifically designed to meet the local emissions standards and regulations. So there's a number of differences in the way these emission systems actually work between different regions. So you do need to be very careful when you get information online that it applies to your engine and not one from, say, North America if you were based in the UK, for example. So the 190 horsepower versions have a really nice turbocharger that's designed to produce a nice lot of boost and spools up relatively quickly. So it's a really, really nice unit. But also the fuel 
system and lots of other components within the engine have been beefed up to maximize the reliability of having 190 horsepower from the engine, which is great news if you're wanting to tune it. It just means you've got a stronger and more reliable base to work from and you can extract that little bit more power from what the Volkswagen Group have already done. By reducing internal friction in the engine, by improving the control you've got over the fuel delivery, the fuel timing, and the really efficient choices of turbochargers in the 2.0-litre Gen 3 TDI engines, you've overall got more efficiency. It's a much better design. The engines are lighter than their forebears, so some people might point to a lighter engine as being less strong or less sturdy, but in real terms, these engines are still pretty strong and pretty reliable. So we've not seen any major issues from these engines yet. Let us know if you found some common problems that keep cropping up on the Gen 3 versions of the TDI engine, because the aim of the Volkswagen Group was to iron out all of the problems and all of the unreliabilities that dogged their earlier versions. And I personally believe they've gone a long way to addressing those issues. So lubrication has been improved in the Gen 3 engine. There's a new oil separator that's been incorporated into the engine block itself. And that really improves the efficiency of the crankcase ventilation system. Remember the problems people had with carbon deposits on the valves with the air coming in through the crankcase ventilation system? Well, Volkswagen themselves have come up with a system now to separate that oil out. So there's little need to fit an oil separator or oil catch can yourself to these Gen 3 engines. So we've got a, a new design of crankshaft, lighter pistons, and a lighter flywheel. So overall, this engine is lighter. You're going to feel the power much more in these engines. You, you're going away from the old heavy diesel units of years gone by. And we've got a really refined diesel engine that we're working with now. So I've always maintained that on some of the older diesel engines, you shouldn't go with a lighter flywheel or convert from a dual mass to a single mass. But it does seem on these engines, they are much more refined, much smoother. You can get away with the lighter dual mass flywheels or even the single mass flywheels. Um, some people that are fitted them recommend increasing the tick over slightly just to avoid the problems they were getting with stalling. But let me know in the comments what your experience has been with a lighter flywheel on these Gen 3 engines. The cooling system has also been improved. You've got a larger radiator, a much better designed cooling system, allowing a lot more control over the engine's heat up cycles and maintaining a, a, a steady temperature inside the engine when it's actually running. I'm hoping the coolant pump they're using is more reliable than the ones of old that would tend to break. So I've not seen anything to indicate that there is a problem with them. Let me know in the comments if you know differently. But generally, it does look like Volkswagen has moved in the right direction on these Gen 3 engines. So part of the design criteria for the EA288 and the Gen 3s or the Evo version of this engine was a uniform flow distribution into the cylinders, a consistent flow distribution to the crankcase, cross flow in the cylinder head from the outlet to the inlet side, generally better coolant flow through the engine to allow the channels and fins that have been designed to transfer the heat from the block to the coolant just to allow them to work more effectively. And the flow guide has been improved. So you'll notice this more in the warm up. The engine will warm up more quickly and you won't see the cool down that you get on those really cold, frosty mornings that you maybe saw on some of the earlier diesel engines. So on the 2 litre TDI, the Gen 3 and the EA288 revision that they did, there's some very clever stuff going on to deal with the EGR problem. So the EGR was starting to clog up with soot. Instead of pushing the sooty exhaust from the engine through the EGR into the intake, it now goes through the DPF first, which eliminates a lot of the soot. So that significantly reduced the risk of soot buildup inside the EGR system. So it's quite a clever fix. It's quite obvious, really, why they didn't do it initially. I don't know. Probably because they rushed out all of these emission control features to try and meet those ever more stringent emission standards and regulations. So there were three, I counted three main types of EGR system on the Gen 3 2 litre TDI engines. So you've got a cooled high pressure EGR system without the low pressure EGR part. You've got the cooled low pressure without the high pressure EGR. 
you've got the cooled high pressure without the low pressure EGR, and you've got the cooled low pressure EGR with the non-cooled high pressure EGR. So depending on your region and the engine version really determines which EGR system Volkswagen Group have gone for. So there's a clever setup with the alternator now. The alternator in the Evo versions feeds a 48 volt battery as well as the conventional 12 volt battery. And this effectively creates a mild hybrid where the alternator is used as a motor when you put current through the alternator instead of being something that creates current from the movement of the crank in the engine it actually helps to rotate the engine. So it's particularly clever because you don't have to add a supplementary electrical motor to the engine. You're using what's there. Obviously they've beefed up the alternator so that it can work in this way and it's required quite a bit of clever engineering, but it really is quite a genius design and it does create that mild hybrid. Obviously you don't get the electric motor kicking in as frequently as you would in some other electric hybrid versions of cars but it does help to improve the fuel economy. So they've had lots of criticism over the years. They've been through the diesel emissions scandal, lots of problems. They've had lots of reliability issues with some of the earlier diesel units. Generally though, they engineer out these problems as they go, and they've certainly done a good job in doing that. And the Gen 3 really is a, a phenomenal leap forward, both in terms of efficiency, and we know that instead of cheating the emissions, they've actually sorted out the emissions and they've got decent setup now that produces clean, efficient power from the two litre TDI engine. And they're also phenomenally powerful and much more refined and smooth, especially when you compare them back to the earlier Pumpadusa versions of the engine. So emission standards now have become very, very stringent. So it's a, a major consideration of a manufacturer to ensure that their engines and their cars meet these emissions regulations. And diesels are now cleaner than ever. You could argue that a diesel engine is now more efficient than a petrol or gasoline powered car, just because of the the technology they've had to put into it, the various filters, the various control systems within it, and the complexities of the injection process. It really is a science now getting that fuel into the engine, getting it correctly atomized and extracting as much power as possible. So the engine design themselves really enable the computer within the engine to have a lot more control over all the aspects of the combustion process that goes on inside this two litre TDI diesel engine. So one of the most significant changes we've seen is the addition of SENT, S-E-N-T. So in a traditional older diesel engine, you would generally have a sensor with a wire going to the ECU, and each sensor would have its own wire. So SENT effectively creates a network within the engine where each of the sensors can send a signal down this system to the ECU. So it might say, hey, I'm the temperature sensor and I'm currently reading this. I'm the crank sensor and I'm getting this information that you'll need. So all these signals are flowing into the ECU. It's much faster, it's a digital system. So the problem you had with the old analog system is if the wires became close Close to other high voltage wires or there's something in the engine affecting the current, it can actually affect the readings that you get from those sensors and cause all sorts of reliability problems and those are really hard to track down problems. So moving over to an all digital system was certainly a good thing and added a lot of benefits to this engine. The data is sent faster it's more accurate and the complexity of the sensors, the information the ECU has to work with is a lot more complex now than it used to be in those early days of building a diesel engine. So another revision that's happened with the Evo engines particularly is the twin dosing using two catalysts. So conventionally one catalyst or a selective catalyst reduction would be applied to the exhaust but now we have one that's located fairly close to the engine. It reaches operating temperature very, very quickly. That's an oxidation catalytic converter, which reduces the NOx levels coming out of the exhaust. So it eliminates unburnt fuel, hydrocarbons, and carbon monoxide. The DPF acts as the SCR, the Selective Catalyst Reduction, and that uses AdBlue. That reduces the nitrogen oxides coming out of the engine. So having that second SCR or catalyst in the exhaust really comes into its own at the high RPM driving and just further reduces the emissions that you make at those high RPM loads. So it's been a great way of reducing the emissions of these engines and they are fantastically clean. In most areas and regions, they exceed by a fair margin the 
emissions regulations that have been applied to these types of engines. So the EGR system or the exhaust gas recirculation effectively dumps some of the exhaust gases into the intake. So the increased heat will reduce the amount of oxygen that the air is carrying in. It will take up some of the space of the intake charge so it has less oxygen. And this helps minimize the NOx emissions and improves the fuel economy. However, you want to very carefully control where this is going going to happen because it is going to affect the performance of the car. There are various different EGR systems and setups on the new Gen 3 2 litre TDI engines that are used in various regions. So basically the EGR will divert some of the exhaust gases either before the turbo, the low pressure area, or after the turbo, the high pressure area. It's injecting those exhaust gases into the flow of compressed air after the turbo. You want the exhaust gas temperatures to be lower than they are when they first come out of the engine, obviously. You don't want to be putting lots of heat in or you're going to get problems with the way the engine burns the fuel. By using both the high pressure and the low pressure parts of the intake, the Volkswagen engineers have produced an engine that meets emission standards without cheating in the software. So the merits of whether you should keep the EGR system and if it causes significant problems and it's something you should do away with is a matter of debate. I've done another video that goes into the pros and cons of deleting that EGR system and what you can expect from it if it is indeed sapping the performance of the engine in its everyday operation. So a few more revisions to the 2 litre TDI engine were made. So moving on to the cylinder head design of the EA288, we've got some interesting innovations that have been introduced on this. So the intake and exhaust valves within the head and the ports they sit in have been redesigned to encourage a swell of air going into the engine just to maximize the velocity and maximize the way that the fuel mixes with the air in the engine. Heat management in the head has been carefully thought of. We had problems with early heads cracking, which a lot of people thought was down to heat issues. So the, the design really enhances the cooling capabilities of the car's cooling system to just make sure that the head temperature doesn't ever run away with itself. You've actually got three cooling circuits in the head, a micro cooling system built into the head itself, and the outlet is now placed in the bottom plate, redirecting the coolant into the engine block itself. The water jacket is split into an upper and lower water jacket core. That's been designed to maximize heat dissipation in those hot zones around the combustion chambers themselves. And then only at the outlet have you got the two cooling channels being combined to go to the radiator. A lot of thought has gone into cooling the cylinder head and the crankcase itself. So we've now got an integrated valve train module in the head itself on the engine, which differentiates it from the earlier Gen 2 and Gen 1 versions of this engine. The camshaft itself has been designed to resist friction, so there's a number of innovations that have gone into that. The valve train is now really a, a standalone module, so they can effectively swap that out for a more efficient version. So they've not got to redesign the whole engine. Um, this module can just be replaced in future iterations and revisions of the engine. So that certainly lowers the manufacturing cost. They use a needle bearing to lower the frictional losses that you would get on the camshaft. The bearing on the camshaft is uh, provided with a separate oil gallery. The oil flow into the head has been optimised, so you've got very good lubrication in the head, which is really where you need it. The blank valve train and cylinder head cover modules are effectively the same shape and format on all the engines which can potentially make upgrading them more simple. Hopefully we won't have this issue where you're trying to guess which version or which revision of the engine you have and which parts will fit on that. So in trying to lower the manufacturing costs, Volkswagen have actually simplified things and they're hopefully going to keep things consistent between generations of the engine, which will make life easier for those looking for aftermarket upgrades, hopefully. So overall, we've got a fantastic engine. Early signs are it's reliable and the Volkswagen Group have ironed out all of the problems that they've had with the previous engines. Let me know in the comments if you feel differently, if you know something or you've got experience with these engines and you've noticed a pattern forming. So we're not talking about the inherent issues you get with random engines from manufacturers with age or neglect that crop up. We're looking for very specific patterns that would indicate some kind of design flaw or design issue. 
issue that we need to be aware of. So we've got another video coming up looking at tuning these Gen 3 or Evo versions of the 2 litre TDI engine. So please stay tuned for that. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. And if you can boot that like button, that'll really help us to get out there. Thank you for watching and check out this video.